All right, hello everyone. Um, we've got uh, uh, our first lecture video we're doing live online uh, for this uh, last portion of our quarter. Um, I have some few things I wanted to talk about um, to get things started here. Um, but first, uh, everyone doing all right with the, the chat and um, uh, connecting with Skype and everything? Everyone can hear me, no problems. We're all good. Maybe if you're having problems, then you wouldn't be able to uh, communicate. <laughs> Pretty smooth using the link. Yeah. Okay. Um, by all means, jump in. You got questions or want to contribute anything. Um, as I mentioned in the email, uh, I think a good protocol for how this happens is uh, have your microphone muted uh, to start with, but you're absolutely free to use it throughout the class, um, just as kind of like a virtual classroom space. Um, but a, a good kind of thing when I when I um, do the, on my online classes in the past, uh, that you sort of if you want if you want to use your microphone, if I'm talking and yapping and doing my lecture thing, um, if you want to jump in, just say in the IM thing, uh, just say hey I got a question or something. Um, I can see you typing. So I'll know maybe something's on the way, uh, but just a quick thing like I've got a question, and then send that, and then type in whatever you want to say. Or when I get to a breaking point, then you can unmute your microphone. Kind of, you you can pick up on the social cues. I think uh, you know, jump in with your microphone if you want to. Uh, that's totally fair and cool, and you're invited to do that. Um, and I think that using the the text message uh, function as a way of kind of like raising your hand, I think uh, makes this work out pretty good. Um, so let me know um, if you want to jump in on things. Um, the uh, the other thing uh, I want to just make sure everyone is straight on. That was a big email that I sent out yesterday, uh, but I want to make sure that people know um, the the way to get attendance credit, whether you're live. Or if you're watching this later on YouTube, will be via a um, a little quiz I'm going to set up on Canvas. You'll start seeing these pop up now uh, under the attendance grades. You know, I already had assignments on Canvas for um, attendance, and I just like manually inputted all of them. Um, from here on out, there's going to be a little quiz, and it's not a quiz that's based on substance, like you know, what is the third criteria for of uh, statistical generalizations or something. I'll just give you a code word at some point during this video and then you'll just input the code word into the quiz and that's how I'm going to track it. But I'm, I'm not going to do live attendance, I think, um, what for people that are present here right now uh, just because of time and it'll it'll be a mess. So and people jumping in late and all that kind of stuff. So um, if, even if you're live, the rules are the same as if you're watching it on YouTube later. Go into the to the quiz on Canvas. It's not up right now, but I'll I'll have that published in, in the next couple hours, um, and uh, and you can input it, uh, and that's how you'll get the credit for for attendance. Um, any questions about that, or just the mechanics of how this whole video lecture thing is going to go? Repeat the grading, like how the grading is going to happen, Kevin. Yeah, okay. So you'll watch this video, whether you're doing it live right now, like you are, uh, or if people are watching this later on YouTube. Um, at some point in the video, I will give you a code word. Uh, write it down or remember it or just input it um, once the quiz is up uh, to a quiz that's on Canvas that'll be that'll have today's date, it'll say code for video lecture 3-3, like March 3rd. You'll go in there, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be a quiz with one question, it'll say what's the code word, and you'll just put in the code word, and then I'll go through those and grade them, and that's how you'll get your, your credit. Does that make sense? Yes, cool, awesome. Um, so that's how that's going to proceed. Um, 
I'm I'm definitely anticipating uh, there'll probably be some confusion along the way here, or you know we'll be shaking off the rust early on, uh, and I'll be flexible and understanding about that. Like I, you know, you know how I roll. Um, but uh, I think this, when I teach online and do this, it, it doesn't take long for this to get worked out. Um, it's not a terribly elaborate process. Um, but if you're having trouble with it or have any questions or confusion about it, by all means, contact me. Which is another thing I, I definitely wanted to say. Uh, a couple other things, just following up on our decision and the email I sent out yesterday. Um, first up, um, I know that this... Uh, well, I want to first. I want to thank everyone. In the last 24 hours, I have received a lot of communication from students, and I'm I'm not going to repeat the details of people's personal situations or anything like that. But what I can report is that many people have earnestly expressed gratitude that we're taking this course of action, and the circumstances are are not just. Uh, peace of mind in some cases they're very very serious and what this means is access to education and uh, people have been thanking me for this and I haven't really done anything other than to just be responsive to the circumstances in the way that I did I mean that's that's what I can maybe be thanked for but most of the thanks really goes to all of you because um, I know that doing things this way is is like it's mixing it up it's and there's definitely inconvenience to it. It's like trying to re, in some ways, redo the way that we're doing the class. And um, I want you to know that those um, costs that are involved are deeply appreciated by not just a few people, but by a lot of people. And you, you deserve thanks for that. I also know that it's more than just inconvenience for some students, that this has its own set of complications to it, which is all the more um, deserving of thankfulness and gratitude for uh, us trying to just make a unideal situation work in the most ideal way that we can. And following up on that, you, I mean, empty gratitude is one, you know, that's like it's a concern about that. But uh, on my part here, of thank you for thanking you for accommodating this way of doing things. But I want to follow that up with deep support. Um, so I. Been, I mean, I've been encouraging all quarter long for students to, to really reach out to me and let me help you and give you support and set you up for success with this class. But given some of the complications with doing things in this format, um, all the more, like, even more do I encourage you to do this. Like I said in the email, um, I'm trying to anticipate as and make this go as smoothly as possible and that fits everybody's needs as much as possible but my ability to imagine and, and have imaginative empathy and to try to anticipate and set things up as, as well as possible is not going to be perfect and I really want it to be as perfect as possible and a big way in which we make that happen is by you letting me know what you what's happening for you and um, giving me the opportunity of being of being even more responsive to your circumstances so please 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 stay in contact with me don't feel um, or I can't tell you how to feel but I would encourage you to to not let if there are any feelings of of um, oh I don't want to rock the boat or I know this is important so I'm just gonna take it or, or deal with it or something I don't want those uh, kinds of reactions getting in the way of receiving support or accommodation from me or flexibility or whatever I can do um, that would make your experience uh, for the end of the quarter here better. So that that is a really, really top priority to me. I, I know that this move definitely has its benefits, otherwise we wouldn't be doing it, um, but it also has its costs, and those also need to be handled equitably. Um, and 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 not just the benefits you know as being motivated from equity so definitely wanted to say those two things a big thank you um, and why what the grounds are for that thankfulness like this is a really big deal to a lot of people that we're doing it this way and also a again a huge emphasis and encouragement on staying in contact with me um, and letting me support you even for those of you who don't have um, larger complications with the format here um, 
the, maybe more on the level of inconvenience. I definitely know from teaching online classes in the past that once it's once you do once you're doing things in an online format, it's harder to stay up and be like responsible and uh, sort of studious, you know, in in tracking. It's very easy to let something like watching a video lecture slide, uh, or once once we're not seeing each other every day and having all this kind of contact. I mean, we should be seeing each other, but you know, in person, you know, having the in-person interactions, um, it's easy to kind of slip off the radar. And I really don't. I want. I want us to do everything that we can to to address or keep that force from really um, taking hold and undermining our efforts here. Uh, we still have a good chunk of stuff to do here at the end of the quarter, even with the as I've talked about before the uh, the way in which we're changing up our class um, for this third unit on informal fallacies too. Like we're just we're really trying to get through to e exam two. Um, that's the really big objective for the remainder of the quarter. Um, that's still a big chunk of stuff to do, and I want to be able to uh, provide all the same kind of support uh, that I, I can when, I'm, when we are doing things on campus. Um, there, it's going to look a little different, but I want to re pr retain as much of the, that opportunity as we possibly can. Part of that theme will actually be um, the study sessions. So I was hosting uh, weekly study sessions on Tuesday, uh, the homework lab, uh, at 1.30. And I'm planning on doing the same thing today. You just come right back to this chat room at 1.30, and um, I'll be hanging around here to meet with people. I'm not going to record it, um, but uh, I will be here to, to go over things with you um, and review. I know there's a bunch of people who want to look at some stuff with logic um, and do some exam one review, and we can do that. So uh, for all that stuff, uh, any any questions, anyone who's here in chat, uh, got any questions, anything I can clarify about what I've been saying so far, or just any comments that you want to share too. I, I will say one more thing on the technical aspect here. I got the headphones in. Even if I had my speakers up, this microphone doesn't pick them up very well. So if you are talking in the chat or you use your microphone, I will probably repeat what you say so that it's on the recording for people watching this on YouTube later. So I'll, I'll do things like that. But any any comments or questions people have so far? Can we share memes? <laughs> um, I guess think about like if you'd bring it up in class, you bring it up here kind of thing. I don't know. Um, I don't have a policy against memes. Don't want them to be super distracting or something, but um, I don't think there'd be a, a problem with that happening in the chat. What did, what did you do? Did you want to put some image macro or something up, Kevin? For future reference, okay, fair enough. Let's see, Cindy, I see you're typing something. Good to see you too. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, um, so I'm I'm gonna keep going here. Um, I'm gonna be doing some screen sharing, um, both for uh, a, a like a whiteboard situation, but also for uh, lecture notes here too. Um, I'll probably just kind of switch back and forth a little bit here. If you want to pull up Lecture 5 um, on your computer so you've got that to follow along with, I think that'd be a really good thing. I, if we were in the classroom right now, I'd be putting it up on the projector. Uh, so let's let's take a look at that. Um, let me do this. Uh, share a window. Hmm. Come on, computer. I want to draw what I had on the board uh, yesterday um, with statistical generalizations. And and then uh, we talked about what they are yesterday. And um, 
I drew a little diagram so you can see like the moving parts of, of how they work. Um, but I, I want to, to, the main objective for today is to talk about how to evaluate statistical generalizations. So that's, that's my main ambition for the lecture today. Um, but I want to use a whiteboard. There we go. Uh, but people will see that open windows in the Okay. All right. So, is everyone seeing the whiteboard right now? My Microsoft Paint uh, window is that showing up? Or oh, it looks like it's still connecting. Um, it may not be up right now. Uh, yes, I have a little cold, Jose, but <laughs> it's it's fine. I'm I'm used to being cold. I'd rather much rather be cold than hot. Uh, is it sharing now? Now, okay, awesome. All right, so we're gonna do statistical generalizations. All right, and you can still hear me. The microphone is picking up. Wonderful. Okay, so statistical generalizations had this kind of structure to them. We had two categories of things we're talking about. There's a sample, a sample class, and a reference class. And these are just categories of, of subjects. Um, they, the sample set could have just one thing in it. Um, it doesn't have to be many. Uh, it could be many too. Um, but then we've got a, a reference class, which is a larger set of things, which contains whatever is in the sample. And when I draw these lines that are pointing at um, the, these sets of things, um, what I'm doing is identifying a property that that set possesses, like the predicate to a subject. And what we're doing in a statistical generalization is saying that this hope this is making sense here we're saying that we should believe something I'm drawing a therefore symbol here we should believe that the reference class has some property on the grounds that a sample taken of that reference class has that same property so I'm drawing it as property X right now so that's making sense this people who are in class yesterday uh, re maybe remember this um, anyone who was not in class yesterday is this making sense this is just the structure of how a statistical generalization argument works. Okay. Um, we use a, a, I mentioned that uh, polls are um, a really good example of statistical generalization. So if you want to figure out like um, <clears throat> what percentage of voters in a state on, for say Super Tuesday, I think. Um, so who's gonna vote for which, which Democratic candidate, for example, because that's the exciting race here. Um, which one, who, how many people in that whole state are going to vote for that candidate. So the whole state, all those people would be the reference class. Um, and we're curious about property X, like how many of them are going to vote for, say, Biden. Um, and what you might do is pull some of them. That would be your sample. Um, and then uh, you'll see maybe a certain percentage, I don't know, I'm not going to make up a number here about this, I'm not a political prognosticator, but whatever percentage, let's say X percent of the people sampled are voting for Joe Biden, then the generalization would be that X percent, that same percentage of people in the entire state are going to vote for Biden, that kind of thing. Um, I'm curious for people who are um, uh, on, in the chat right now, when you're seeing my Microsoft Paint picture, do you also get to see my cursor? Do you see my cursor moving around for being able to point at things? Yes, awesome. Okay, so I can kind of gesture at stuff and it'll it'll read. Yeah. 
Okay. I, I, I'm assuming those yeses are saying I can I can do the gesturing. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to switch colors here now. Uh, what would be a good color? Let's do green. Um, red, red I thought would maybe be good, but let's go with green. Eh, red, red's maybe better. Let's do red. Okay, so that's just what a statistical generalization is. Um, let's talk about how, what the standards are. And, and actually, let's go to my lecture notes really briefly. Um, let's share a window here. Lecture 5. I'm just going to pop over here to this. So now you should be seeing a Microsoft Word document uh, in a second once it figures itself out. Okay, and I think our our students uh, is are is everyone able to see now two windows, lecture five and and the whiteboard. It's actually showing me that they're both sharing, so I'm kind of curious whether they're both popping up for you. They don't show up both at once. Okay, all right. So right now you just have the lecture notes. Yeah, okay. All right. Thank you for the feedback, everyone. That helps. All right. Let's make this a little bit bigger in the window. Okay. So <clears throat> the, the standards that you got here from the book... The first one is, should we accept the premises? First note I want to make is, don't worry about this. Um, accepting the premises as being true is, uh, is just something we always know we care about for every argument, no matter the type. So this, this kind of goes without saying. And as we've mentioned before in the class, um, this is uh, figuring this out, like being a critical thinker about this, is really the entire world of epistemology. Like, how do we know anything? Um, is is what philosophical epistemology focuses on, and uh, that's a big can of worms and a can of worms that we can't open uh, for this class, at least. Uh, we, I mean, we can study it, and there's a lot of insight that can be gained about how to go about thinking about knowledge more generally. What we're really focused on in this class is reasoning, critical reasoning. So, just like with validity, we were like only wondering if the premises are true must the conclusion be true or is it possible for it to be false we're sort of assuming the truth of the premises kind of like granting something for the sake of argument that's the same thing we're doing here just uh, don't worry about whether the premises are actually true like whether someone falsifies falsified the the polling data or something we're not going to think about that we're going to focus more on even if the premises are true even if the claim about the sample is accurate does that justify does that give us good reason for accepting the truth of the conclusion about the reference class so on the exam I will not be asking you to evaluate uh, statistical generalizations with this first criteria this can be considered basically cut from the list okay um, that's the first thing to say that makes sense it's not that it doesn't matter, it's just that we, we already know this is always going to be the case with any argument that we're evaluating. It's got to have true premises to be a good argument. We're trying to focus our attention on the second standard of good arguments, whether they have good support relations. Jaden, I, I saw you about to type something and then it looked like you backed off. H how's this going so far? We good? Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so the other thing I want to note about how the book is carving up these criteria um, in, and how I'm going to do it a little differently, we are going to care about sample size. So is the sample size large enough? That will, That's straightforward. We're going to use that. And is the sample biased? We're going to talk about this too. But then the last criteria the book has is, is the result biased in some other way? And the way I want us to handle it for the purposes of this class is I want you to break up these two things that the book talks about as bias in interpretation 
and bias in investigation. So where the book treats these as part of one category, we're going to split it up into two. And there's some reasons for this. So um, I want to, just for a second here, let's, let's just stop sharing for a moment. Um, I'm going to go back to the whiteboard in a second here, but I thought I would... Uh, wait, what's going on? Oh, no. <laughs> my poor computer. Okay, all right. Uh, so you can see my face again. Um, I want to just do a little interlude here about um, bias in general. So one of the things I really like about teaching this unit on statistical generalizations is we get to talk about how bias is not just some um, monolithic phenomenon that um, is, is a thing all by itself, like bias. Um, I do think that we can offer a generalized definition of bias, um, and I've talked about this before in the class. Um, I think we, we still want to be careful about thinking about what counts as bias and what doesn't, but if there is a common pattern to it, like a theoretical pattern to bias, it's basically any force, any irrational or irrational influence on belief formation. So when we form beliefs, that happens in a myriad number of ways. Sometimes it's done on the basis of evidence and argument. So we're thinking rationally about it, so so to speak. I'm like, hmm, what makes sense to believe? And then when I'm like, oh, that's a really good argument. And yeah, I might make mistakes about this, but I'm like, oh, that's a really good argument. I'm going to believe that. That's not what we're talking about when we're talking about bias. What we're worried about are things like, say, uh, just as one example here, confirmation bias, or, or actually let's do um, conformity. So when the people in your community believe something, there's a kind of psychosocial pressure to treat their belief as having more legitimacy. Maybe all the way toward being like, well, everyone else believes it, so I guess I'm going to believe it too. But even less than that, even someone who's like a critical thinker can have their critical thinking warped or distorted by that force. Right, so they might give more initial legitimacy to a view that there is widespread belief about uh, versus something that doesn't have widespread belief. And maybe not in a way where that's like a rational argument is behind that, but it's just a psychological tendency that we have. That would be an example of a bias, an irrational or irrational force that's influencing belief formation. But that definition, even though we can provide it, and I would argue for it as like a pretty decent definition for bias, the bias phenomenon in general, it's not very helpful um, because there are so many different forces that would fall into that category. And they all have to be kind of resisted in unique ways. Um, so if there's these unique set of problems, there also are going to need to be a specialized set of strategies for responding to those problems or overcoming those, those uh, issues. And that really shows up here in um, statistical generalization. Uh, I oftentimes uh, have during uh, a, cla a quarter where I'm teaching this class with exam two, where a student writes in their exam answer for one of these problems, um, this is a bad argument because it's biased. The end. And no specification of what particular forms of bias. You, you might have an intuition that's like, there's something fishy going on with this one. There's bias going on here. But we want to have a much more detailed and nuanced uh, understanding of what exactly is happening there, um, which force of bias is in effect, and what is our cause for recognizing that that's what's happening in this case. Very much like, um, here's a parallel to, to what's going on with this unit about bias. Um, let's go back into our brains to uh, chapter two and conversational implication. You might intuitively pick up um, not just that there's implication present, but that there's something goofy happening with an utterance. You know, that the, the way that Paul Grice is talking about uh, implication as generated once there's something strange or weird or unexpected uh, in someone's behavior, and then the implied meaning is a way of resolving that. You might be able to tell, hmm, that's weird. That's weird that they said that. Like on the exam, the first exam with the Han Solo problem, there's something weird about what Han Solo is saying when he says, then I'll see you in hell. And this quarter I had a lot of people misidentify which Gricean maxim is in effect there. So you might be able to tell that there's something going on, 
but we'd want to pin it down a little bit more specifically. What particular expectation is being thwarted, right, that's being violated? That's kind of like what we want to do here. Your, your intuition might be able to pick up on how there's bias going on in the area, but we want to be able to identify what particular form of bias, and there's going to be three with statistical generalizations. Bias in sampling, bias in investigation, and bias in interpretation. So now I'm going to explain what all those three things are and, and how they work. Um, but just checking in again really quickly here. So far, so good with what I'm talking about. Bias, any questions, comments from chat? Sounds good so far, Adrian says. Cool. Colton looked like he wanted to say something. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, so um, just as a little interlude here, I'm definitely used to online teaching as having a little less of the like back and forth of rapport, and it many times does just turn into me like talking into a box. Um, but I want to uh, just kind of go on the record again as saying that um, your participation really does make a class better. And even in the online format, um, all the more I'd encourage you to like jump in and ask questions and give comments here um, because some of the stuff we're going to be doing in the next week is pretty tricky um, and I want it to be as robust a presentation as possible so you help with that all right <clears throat> let's do some more screen sharing here let's go back to my little whiteboard and I'm gonna put into the drawing um, where all these different uh, standards go and that's one of the reasons I like doing these drawings is that they um, they're the arguments that we're analyzing have lots of moving parts and the criteria are going to be looking in different places for uh, where where that that principle or possible concern could show up and so it really helps to organize your thinking about it to know where you've got to be looking for something so standard number one is about sample size and this one is pretty straightforward with um, sample size we're just looking directly at the sample and how large it is basically the larger the sample the better the statistical generalization the stronger this inference down here okay so let's say I'm trying to do a political poll um, and I talk to five of my friends and then I generalize about what all Americans are going to think on the basis of what five people think. That's not going to be a good, uh, a good statistical generalization for a number of reasons. There's going to be bias concerns here too, but just on the, on the basic level that five people is not good enough. Now if I talk to 10,000 people, if I pull 10,000 people for that survey, that's still... Um, you know small compared to the reference class but it is a much stronger statistical generalization and remember again strength is on a spectrum it can be stronger it can be weaker and uh, sample size is identifying one of the variables that makes a statistical generalization stronger or weaker so so this one I think is a little bit more straightforward the principle you just got to remember is larger sample stronger generalization smaller sample weaker generalization and that's it um, I want to check in again because I, I think I don't have too much more to say about sample size there but I want to make sure that that uh, is making sense to all of you are we good on that okay Next up, we've got uh, our next standard here is we're concerned about sample bias. Ooh, oops, bias. There we go. And <clears throat> what are we doing here? Well, we're comparing. Um, we're looking at the sample in comparison with the reference class. So there we go. All right. Going back to my example of trying to figure out what all Americans think by talking to my friends, um, we could have concern about sample bias in this regard. 
Um, actually, I want to use a, a slightly different case. Um, I want to use a, a, a slightly different example that I, I think would be helpful. So let's say um, we're going to... Oh, someone's requesting to take control. <laughs> Nikolai, you're trying to take control of the screen sharing. Um, I think I'm going to deny that. Uh, <laughs> any any comment? Were you were you trying to do something, Nikolai? Uh, okay, I'm just gonna move on. Okay, so let's say I want to figure out um, what all Americans think. So Americans would be reference class here. Let's say I'm trying to figure out what they think about gun control. And uh, to figure that out, I'm going to do a poll, but I'm only going to poll people who are members of the NRA. So the sample class is completely composed of people who are members of the, natural, the National Rifle Association. Now, there's going to be a distinct concern about sample bias here. And the reason, it, there's, there's two conditions that are needed for sample bias, but we're worried about the sample giving a distorting of, uh, effect on understanding what's going on with the entire reference class. So if there is a distortion here, it'll come down to two conditions that you've got to be thinking about. The first question, I'm going to actually, I'll, I'll make it on the, if I had a whiteboard, I'd draw this. So let's just put it up here. Sample bias conditions. The first one is you want to ask yourself, Is the sample not representative of the reference class? And in this illustration, it clearly isn't. Um, where the reference class would be all Americans, and not all Americans are members of the NRA. So there's a way in which the sample is not representative. This is why when people are doing political polls, they're always trying to control proportionately for certain demographics. Um, things that could be true of the sample that could affect um, the, what's going on with the reference class. But the first thing we just want to figure out is, is the sample not re representative of the reference class? The second question, though, and don't forget this one. A lot of times students think about the first one, but don't think about the second condition. But to have sample bias, you need both. Um, the second question, or the second condition to be tracking, would be to ask the question, is the... Whoop, so if the answer to the first question is yes, is the way in which the sample isn't representative relevant to the property ooh, oops property oh my gosh my microphone is messing up my ability to type the property in question so in the case of uh, our NRA example so we got to actually I'm going to put another drawing here we also got to be thinking about sample bias and this comparison with an eye to what's going on with this property down here. So let's say I'm only talking to members of the NRA. Um, so there's a way in which the sample is not representative of the reference class. Do I think that being a member of the NRA or not is going to impact what someone's opinion is about gun control? And what do you think? What do you, chat, you think that is relevant? I mean, really, this is going to depend on your background assumptions. You're going to have to keep your brain turned on during all this inductive argument evaluation. Um, so you'll want to be able to articulate why you think yes or no about this when you're doing your analysis on your homework problems or for the exam. So yes, people are thinking, yes, there is a, re a connection of relevance between whether you're a member of the NRA and whether what your opinion is going to be about gun control. One of the basic reasons why this would be true is that part of the whole point of the NRA is to advocate for certain political decisions with regards to guns and, and gun control issues. Uh, Colton's asking, are there any more mechanisms for exploring the bias of the speaker like the framing of the argument? Yes, that's so that's what I was trying to say earlier is that bias exists on so many different continuums. Um, and what we're trying to do is articulate some of the really specific ones. Um, 
framing of the argument is um, maybe going to be a, a separate thing than something that we're going to talk about. But if you're meaning by that something like how I frame the question when I'm doing polling, yeah, that's definitely going to happen. We'll talk about that with the next criteria um, that, that we've got to discuss. But um, I want to, before I get into that, I just want to finish up this stuff about sample bias and why these two conditions are both so crucial. Here's another example. So in, in the case of the NRA one, we'd say, yes, there is sample bias. Why? Well, because the sample is only looking at people who are members of the NRA, and not, ever, not all Americans, not the entire reference class, has that feature. Um, not all Americans are members of the NRA. And being a member of the NRA is relevant to whether or not you, what, what your opinions are going to be about gun control. So, and you'd have to talk about your background assumptions, why there, to give that explanation. Contrast this case with a second case. Let's say again, I'm trying to figure out what all Americans think about gun control. So the reference class is uh, all Americans. And uh, I've got a sample here, again, and I figure out a certain percentage of that sample approves of additional gun control. Maybe that's property X, and so I generalize that property over here to all Americans. Let's say this time, the instead of all being members of the NRA, everyone in my sample loves bananas. They're banana lovers. So is, the, oh, is there a way in which the sample is not representative of the reference class? Totally. Not all Americans love bananas. But is the way in which that sample not, isn't representative, is that relevant to the property in question? Um, is whether or not you're a banana lover, does that have anything to do with what your opinions about gun control is going to be? I'm thinking no. Uh, I don't know what your background assumptions are like, but my background assumptions tell me not really. I mean, the only way I could make any kind of connection here is that, uh, well, it's sort of like a banana looks like a gun, maybe. You can, like, hold it like a gun. <laughs> But I don't know how that's going to affect your opinions about gun control. It's not like if you like bananas, you're more likely to like guns or something, unless we're doing some weird Freudian stuff about this. So that, that's not enough. There isn't a relevance uh, between those things. So even if the sample isn't representative, that may not mean that there's bias. In the case with the banana lovers, no bias. No sample bias there. you got to meet both conditions. Okay, is that making sense to everybody? How, any questions popping up about that from people in the in chat here? And uh, while people are typing that right now, um, or I just as I'm checking in, I wanted to make sure before I forget to give you a um, code word. And uh, since I've got my beautiful Mr. Spock mug here, drinking my coffee out of, Mr. Spock is the code word for today's lecture. So there you go, Mr. Spock. Rest in peace. Is there going to be an exciting... Uh, yes, so that's what I was talking about at the beginning, Adrian, and in the email yesterday. I will be creating a quiz on Canvas in the assignments category that will just ask you to, uh, to give the code word that I gave out during the video. And that's how you'll prove to me that you are in attendance today. Or that if you're watching this on YouTube later, that you watch the video. Yeah. Okay, so it sounds like we're good on sample bias. This is a little complicated. And both conditions are really important. So I want to make sure. A lot of times students lose track of the second one. Alex, I see you typing something. We need to answer both questions regardless. Um, so let's say the answer to the first question is no. Like there isn't a way in which the sample is not representative of the reference class. Then there's not going to be any sample bias there. But if the answer is yes, that doesn't automatically mean sample bias, then you got to think about the second question. Is the way in which it's not representative relevant to the property in question? Yeah. Relevance connections are going to show up a lot during uh, inductive e evaluation or evaluation of inductive arguments. This won't be the last time that you have to make a judgment call about whether two things are relevant to each other. And this requires background assumptions. You cannot do this just with a analysis of the concepts and words given in the problem itself. 
You're always going to have to keep your brain turned on, remember everything you know about reality generally, and, and be able to identify what's the ground of the connection between the two things. On what grounds are these two things relevant or not relevant? That's going to be important. Okay, let's go uh, back. Uh, preferred ratio for sample and reference class. Oh, for the first standard for um, sample size? That really depends. Um, it can depend on a lot of factors. Um, it may be um, for things that are much have uh, reference classes that are smaller. Generally, we want a larger ratio. Um, but for reference classes that are really large, like say all Americans, it would be impractical and maybe not necessary to have a sample have the same proportionality. Um, there's a I know there are some um, mathematical stuff here for figuring out what would be the preferred ratio or sort of like minimal standards of this or, or sufficiency standards um, depending on the size of the reference class, how big, how what ratio should the size of your sample be to be statistically significant. Um, but I, I am not uh, savvy to all that math uh, analytics side of this. We're, we're focused on, like I said, uh, um, I think last week on Friday, we're focused on the uh, non-math related standards that affect the rationality of statistical reasoning. So we can identify sample size as being relevant without necessarily cashing that out in terms of all the analytic uh, details of it. Okay, before we leave today here, I, I do want to get to these next two, um, uh, if we can, um, bias in investigation and bias. Oh, someone's got it. Cool. Thanks, Adrian. Bias. Uh, oh, yeah, it's the p-value stuff. Yeah, bias in interpretation. I am a, I'm not uh, super up on that. I'm uh, not super savvy. I know just enough to be dangerous. Okay. We're going to throw a new thing into our model here now. And I'm going to just call it data. Data. Here we go. So imagine there's kind of in between the sample and this property in question, you've got data. In fact, I'm going to do it like this, just to make that super explicit. There we go. Data. All right. And then bias in, inter in investigation is looking at um, how we got our data. And bias in interpretation is looking at the connection between the data and this conclusion about the property in question. So. To talk about this, I'm going to go with a much more complicated illustration. Doing political polls, fairly straightforward. Um, but there are many other things that we want to make generalizations about that aren't as straightforward as a, just a poll. Um, so uh, here's a, I asked students in the past, um, you know, if you've taken a sociology class, what uh, what research projects have you been working on? Because usually sociological studies involve these messier, stickier sorts of situations. And um, I'm going to use an example that, just for the sake of time here, that I got from a student in the past. And uh, they were doing a, uh, they did this really complicated thing, so I'm, I'm um, simplifying it down a little bit from what they initially said, but they were interested in studying sexual deviance. And let's say you wanted, and by sexual deviance here, we just mean, um, sexual lifestyles and behaviors that are off the cultural norm. It doesn't mean they're automatically wrong or immoral or unethical or something. They're just non-normal. Um, they are different from the sort of accepted or dominant cultural uh, recommendations or prescriptions. So if you wanted to say this, like let's say you wanted to figure out what percentage of Bellevue College students are sexual deviants, you can't just ask people straight up about that. <laughs> like you can't just have a survey be like check yes or check no. You're not going to get um, reliable data from people um, because, and, and this happens with a lot of studies, um, there are a number of ways in which someone who is participating in a study might skew their responses or their participation in that study that doesn't present data that actually is um, reflective of what's actually happening with them. Um, Colton's asking, could the term deviant be a negative evaluation? Uh, we'd have that would definitely, if we're thinking back to uh, annotations here, 
it really depends on the context. That's why I had to specify it. I mean, I wanted to say by deviant, we do not mean something with a negative connotation to it. Um, I'm not intending that. Uh, so, but the fact that the word can have that uh, association to that idea in people's minds is why I needed to clarify. Uh, so if there wasn't clarification, you might think, oh, Tim's thinking this, you know, um, but th that might not actually be the case. So yes, depending on the circumstances, uh, deviant could be loaded or not loaded. But when I say explicitly, here's what I mean by it, then then it wouldn't be. Um, okay, so going back to this. Um, <laughs> awesome, Adrian. Uh, so with bias investigation, I'm concerned about how I might get data that is skewed, that doesn't re accurately reflect the sample. Once you've got your sample selected and you don't have bias in it and it's an adequate size, you still gotta have some way of looking at it. You still have to have some way of observing it and figuring out what's happening. And that's how you collect data. And because you can't just maybe do it as straightforward as a political poll, you're gonna have to be a little clever with how you go about that investigation. So the student who was doing the survey, he had to you know, have a bunch of red herrings in it and ask weird tangential questions, not let the participants know what's going on. Um, anonymity helps here to get honest answers as well. Um, but there, there's, you had to approach it tangentially in order to get accurate data. Bias in investigation is gonna apply in any case where we're worried that our observations of the sample are not reflective of what's actually going on there. So it may not be biased in the sense of prejudicial views or warped worldviews or something like that, but just that like my microscope is broken, that would be an example. If my microscope is broken or my I'm doing a like a physics project and my instrumentation is not calibrated properly, then my data is going to not be reflective of what I'm actually studying in my sample. Okay, so that's bias and investigation. But especially in cases where we had to get uh, some we had to get a little clever with how we're collecting the data then there's going to be a pretty meaningful step of how we interpret that data to come to the conclusion that the sample has this property X and that's where bias and interpretation shows up um, I think this is going to be complicated enough that I'm gonna cut our lecture time now especially because people have other classes we'll talk about bias and interpretation tomorrow um, I already gave you the code word so we're good on that um, I wanted to get through all this today, but I, we just didn't get there, so that's okay. Uh, we'll do, bi uh, we'll do um, bias and interpretation tomorrow, and we'll also talk about statistical applications tomorrow as well. Um, and, and like I said in, in um, the email yesterday, I want to check in with you all about this tomorrow. Um, there is a way in which we could start changing the way we do stuff here where the really mandatory lectures to watch are the ones that I already have on YouTube that cover all this material and then we could have our class session is basically extended study session where people just ask questions and um, look over homework problems and all that kind of stuff rather than me lecturing through all the material again because I already have all that recorded we have that resource for this class so maybe tomorrow we can have that discussion at the beginning of class when we get together online again okay um, hope, uh, some people are liking the format uh, that's great if it's not working for you if there are other complications again please talk to me um, but I'll uh, I'll let you go um, and uh, hopefully see you again tomorrow. Thanks to everyone who was here in the chat today. If anyone wants to stick around here, I don't have a class right now. If you have leftover questions from what we covered today, um, I'll keep the, the recording rolling a little bit longer here and people can jump in and um, say whatever you want to say and, and we can talk about it. Colton, I don't know what that emoji is. Is that uh, it's a hand with something behind it, or I'm not sure I. You're welcome, Jerome. It doesn't look like there's any questions. People are all filtering out. Um, so maybe I'll stop the recording then.